Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to track two from Besides uh, San Antonio. Uh, here we have Oshan Marshall with the OPSEC of protesting. Uh, let me introduce Oshan real quick. Uh, he is a developer and security consultant with a background in computer science education and machine learning. In his roles as Secure Ideas, he works uh, with he works on ongoing development projects using Amazon Web Services and breaks other people's web applications. When he's not swallowing gallons of DevOps Kool-Aids, he can be found blasting two steps from hell while hacking, blogging, and coding. Uh, he's going to speak to us a little bit about what OPSEC is, uh, what a protester's threat model may look like, and uh, OPSEC tactics. And I'm really excited for his presentation. Here's Oshan. All right. Um, hopefully, I'm not muted. Uh, welcome to the OPSEC of protesting. Uh, don't worry about taking screenshots or having to take notes. Everything, and I do mean everything I'm talking about, is at tinysi slash opsec. That's my entire slide deck, as well as references and citations to all the research going into this. All right. So who am I and what do I do? I code, I teach, I hack. So when, like in the intro before, I am a full-time developer and a full-time cybersecurity consultant. And when I'm not doing either of those things, I'm teaching people how to take over the world. So when I'm doing a penetration test, I'm diving into networks and other people's web applications, I get to show up, show them their vulnerabilities, tell them that their baby sucks and then go home. But that last part is really important. It's all fine and dandy if I find an exploit, but if I cannot explain in simple terms why a particular vulnerability would increase the operational security risk to my clients or customers and to their customers, I should say, then I really can't help them improve their security posture. So this talk is to help invite you in that same mindset from the perspective of an activist. Last year, I wrote a blog on the OPSEC of protesting. This was immediately after the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Omri, uh, Tony McDade, and Dion Johnson protests. And this was a collection of advice I was handing over to some activist friends. I really focused in on the how. So use MFA everywhere, encryption at rest in transit, password managers, the whole nine yards. And that's in line with my background in the security consulting part of it. But I didn't really focus on the why. And why is really important. Why is critical. Why determines the risks and that leads us to the appropriate countermeasures. We're in a quiet moment now, but that doesn't mean that the government or some other institution isn't going to do something that you disagree with. So protesting is not just a right here in America, it's a responsibility. And societies that fail to adapt crumble. And they become stagnated or bureaucratic. The best feature of free and open democracies and republics is the ability to make pull requests. You can change society's source code. Um, and once you're successful, that change is merged into new legislative policy, new executive action or judicial reinterpretation of law. And you have to do this through pure, pure open and honest speech. And that's the best way to get uh, people to change minds and sway thoughts to and sway public opinion. My goal here in this talk is to arm you to the teeth because as a human being, you have the right to vocalize and present your opinion without the fear of going into prison. And I respect those rights, regardless of the outcome. And let's follow the principle here and get into OPSEC. So OPSEC is the systematic and proven process by which potential adversaries can be denied information about capabilities and intentions by identifying, controlling, and protecting generally unclassified evidence of the planning and execution of sensitive activities. The whole point of OPSEC is protecting yourself from threats by knowing and controlling evidence of your thoughts, 
plans and actions. There are no hypotheticals here. These tactics and thought processes are immediately practical. So say this with me. Aya, that is I quadruple A. This is, this is the five-step process of OPSEC. These steps don't have to be taken in any particular order, but any pre-thought and planning in a previous step will help you in subsequent steps. So that first step is identification of critical information. Second is analyzing your threats. The third is analyzing your vulnerabilities. Once you've got threats and vulnerabilities, you go to number four, which is assessing risk. And then finally, the application of appropriate countermeasures. And they all tie together real neatly. So the first step, identify critical information. So what exactly is sensitive information? I'll give you an example of what is not sensitive information, and that is my naked body. Um, I shower at the local YMCA, so if you really want read-only access to me, you just have to be male, make a commute, and wake up at five in the morning. But knowing that information does not prevent me from being a cybersecurity professional. It doesn't prevent me from ha holding a job in IT. Um, also, it's not ex these sorts of vulnerabilities are not exclusive to me. So if you've taken a flight from 2009 to 2013, you may, and you've gone through the TSA, uh, remember those full body X-ray back scanner things that they had going on? Uh, yeah. So my point is, is people think that certain bits of information are critical, but they're not. And so what is critical depends. I'll give you an example from the Department of Defense. According to the Department of Defense, anything about DOD activities, intentions, capabilities, limitations that the adversary seeks to gain a military, political, technological, economic, or diplomatic advantage is, uh, is a critical information. So usually for a protester, these are the sorts of things that are critical information. Time and location, if you're consciously breaking the law, a personal network or donor list, you may be really good at securing your perimeter and good on your OPSEC, but is your significant other? Is your grandmother? Do you sometimes go to your grandmother's house and use her grandmother's Wi-Fi with a weak Wi-Fi password? So there's some risk there. Um, amoral and illegal activity of senior members. So if you've got an activist organization and someone in senior leadership there has is a convicted felon or is cheating on their wife, if that's if that sort of thing gets out or gets leaked, then that poses some reputational risk to your organization. So ask any politician, for example. So you really need to identify critical information. Then we go into the analysis of threats. So if you're making any meaningful change to society source code, you will be opposed. Now, threats are any potential occurrence that can create an undesired outcome. Hurricanes are threats. Um, but in OPSEC, we mostly focus on people threats, and we call them adversaries. So who are your adversaries when you're protesting? You've got nation states, so you've got governments and law enforcement, but you also have counter-movement protesters. If you are protesting nonviolently, uh, your goal is to persuade the mostly inactive majority to your cause. Some people would put uh, mainstream media as an adversary, and that's not necessarily the case. Most media outlets don't really care one way or another. They simply cater to certain demographics to continue retaining their attention and deriving them as a revenue source. Media only opposes you if you are boring or your goals and ambitions run contrary to the revenue streams. So now that you know who your adversaries are and are not, 
now you need to dive in now you need to dive into what is your adversary's intent and capability from there you can derive the adversary's goals now some adversaries want complete subjugation of your people group um some want full-on genocide others are just want to maintain a nice status quo so usually the goals of an adversary are to limit or suppress or stop the goal, any of the goals of protesters. If you do engage in a protest, the goals could be a, like influencing a court decision, uh, influencing local and uh, read national elections, or putting pressure on certain institutions. The list can go on. An adversary's goal is anything that shuts down any of that. So what tactics does the adversary use? Infiltrators are a real good one. Thurgood Marshall leaked information to the FBI about NAACP activities to weed out communists um, in, the, in the 50s or 60s. Nowadays, when you have a large protest, you notice that as the crowd builds up to a couple hundred to a thousand people, someone will someone will all of a sudden will throw a brick or a Molotov and chaos disseminates from there. So violence is also another tactic. Just because you're protesting peacefully doesn't mean that counter protesters are necessarily are protesting peacefully. They may try to egg you on and try to provoke a response which will be then be captured by the media, and then that narrative will be spun. Now, surveillance is another good tactic that the adversary or your threats will use. And that leads us to the next question of a real threat assessment. And that is, what does the adversary already know about the mission? And what is already exposed? There may be a police or army presence at, uh, at a protest because the date and location was leaked ahead of time. Or maybe you've got this hold of this presentation late and some vital information about how your organization runs and functions, maybe who's who in your leadership. You have to plan around what your adversary already knows. And the level and the extent and the tactics of your threats change between who you associate as a threat. In the United States, for example, being arrested as a protester is pretty benign compared to being a Hong Kong protester, protester against the Chinese government, for example. So you really need to focus in on and adjust your strategy, not only based on the tactics of your threats, but your actual threats themselves. Now we go into the analysis of vulnerabilities. Now here, a vulnerability is just the absence of or a weakness in an asset, safeguard or countermeasure, flaws, errors, or limitations within your organization or tech stack are vulnerabilities. And your adversary is going to be collecting critical information, examining it, and then acting on it. So you have to take advantage, so you have to take inventory of your organization and the uh, technology that you use to communicate. We could take the activist, the hacktivist attacks on Gab and Parler, for example. And I wouldn't call Parler a uh, hack simply because everything that was grabbed in that and that attack was public information. There wasn't any rate limiting on the platform. So when attackers got on, they just simply scraped all the public posts. Gab was actually malicious. It was SQLi. But the reason why the attacker got in was because the source code for the platform was publicly available. So you've got to now analyze your platforms. You also got to analyze your people assets as well. The interconnectedness of an activist community, both online and off, is an asset and a vulnerability. Navy has a phrase, loose lips sink ships. And this is true for activists as well. So my advice here is make sure that sensitive communications and plannings of the inner workings aren't 
out on the open internet. You use the social, you use social media and the public forum to get the word out, but you don't have any critical information out there and you don't show your hand immediately. Uh, one thing that I would like to add is you may not have an immediate vulnerability, but you may have some linkage of OPSEC indicators. And what OPSEC indicators are, it's not critical information in and of itself. But if your adversary gets this piece of information, maybe a secondary piece of information and a third piece, and they tie it together, then all of a sudden they, they get have critical information. So a vulnerability could leak not just critical information, but those little side channel bits of information that can be collected together. Now we go into risk assessment. The risk is the probability of a threat will exploit a vulnerability to cause harm. In information security, we have this famous formula, threat equals, not threat, risk equals threat times vulnerability. And so if you want to reduce your risks, you either um, address your threats or you address your vulnerabilities. Now, as a protester, you are not going to eliminate your threats, but you can mitigate them. And you do that by denying access to OPSEC indicators or denying access uh, to critical information. For vulnerabilities, every vulnerability within your organization that you identify and address also reduces your risk. So blocking information and addressing vulnerabilities. This could be as simple as just patching your system. If you've got, if you haven't been keeping up with patches and the operating systems or the devices you use, zero day exploit, then, well, there wouldn't be zero day exploits anymore, but new fresh exploits can be used to identify your information can be used against you. So now we're cooking. Now we're on the final step, which is applying the appropriate countermeasures. By all, it, hopefully you've identified all your all, well, all vulnerabilities that you can in the beginning, and now you can start to rate which vulnerabilities you, you address by the risk. Now the risk again is the probability that a threat can in, uh, expo can exploit a vulnerability. So from there, you can have a priority of, okay, uh, this is absolutely critical. It's a high chance that it will be exploited. Therefore, we need to address this first because it's game over if the adversary gets a hold of this. And the lower risk, we can keep, be aware of them, but we really need to allocate our resources to the things that are more critical. Again, we could start address these risks in priority and the and the opsec steps aren't ironclad and in specific order but any thought and processing that we do in previous steps will apply to later steps so when we're applying countermeasures we need to assess what is a good countermeasure any good countermeasure would actually lower the risk duh um, the second thing that we need to know about a good countermeasure is that the countermeasure itself should not lead to a leakage of OPSEC indicators or critical information. Then it's not an effective countermeasure. And then finally, and this is where it all ties in, the cost of the countermeasure must be less than the, cost, the risk of the threat ex exposing or exploiting a vulnerability and we'll take it and we'll take an example now that you're armed with this information we go with burner phones right burner phones are actually pretty useful in staying anonymous in large crowds but they have their own cost associated first of all did you buy that burner phone with a credit or debit card are you using it at home are you using that burner phone in proximity to your real phone um, Brian O'Connor and part of Def and is part of his Defcon talk as sees that how shows you how you can associate those bits of information and then expose you. 
So every security control is like that. You really need to work on configuration with it to make sure that you're implementing it properly. Tools that are, so you don't have to throw away your phone instantly. Tools that are useful, that are pretty easy to implement are the same sort of security hygiene tools. So password managers, making sure that your password isn't, um, <laughs> isn't uh, 2020, so, uh, catchphrase that you use constantly, 2020 with an exclamation mark. Um, making sure that you use VPNs, multi-factor authentication on all your online accounts and setting things up on your device so that you use encryption in REST. You've got to be calm and you've got to think through uh, how best to address the risk by priority. Also join InfoSec. Uh, we, we have cookies and uh, we have a lot to teach you on how to be paranoid. And so in the beginning of the talk, I promised you the how, and we would explore the why as we went through. The how is OPSEC. It is using the five steps, identifying critical information, analyzing your threats and vulnerabilities, addre addressing your risks, and applying appropriate countermeasures. Now that's the how, and that leaves us with the why. And I can't give you your why but I can give you mine. I'm here because someone made a pull request. It took planning, it took ingenuity, it took caution. And I want to empower you to make your own. You can change the world for the better. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for B-Side San Antonio. Really appreciate it, Oshan. All right. Um, for those of you in the audience, um, you can submit questions to the CrowdCast platform. You can also submit questions to the Discord channels. We're in track two in the beginning. Uh, if we don't have any questions come in, we'll transition over to the uh, track breakout, track two breakout, uh, where Oshan will be available. Oshan, I really appreciated uh, this, this talk. Uh, I loved the context of like civic responsibility and how OPSEC kind of relates uh, for giving an OPSEC perspective to like a, a mandate or like an innate uh, an innate need to change society for the better. So I really appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank everybody who attended. We've got a uh, great presentation. Thank you, Oshan from SA Radio Club. Thank you. All right, um, I'm going to end the broadcast here. We'll transition over to uh, track two breakout. Thanks again, Oshan. All right. <laughs>